Today's episode is brought to you by Fulton, a modern brand of arch support. Fulton launched the most comfortable, supportive, and sustainable insole on the planet. Fulton insoles have a deep heel cut and comfortable arch support that aligns your body from head to toe. They are made using sustainable materials like vegan cactus leather and cork, allowing them to mold to the shape of your arch and provide customized support. They are also shock absorbing, reducing impact on the body, and are lined with natural foam to make them extra comfortable. Fulton is offering our listeners $10 off your next purchase at walkfulton.com by using the code POD10. That's code P-O-D-1-0 for $10 off at walkfulton.com. Check out the website to see how Fulton can support you. My name is Paige, and I'm the host of Reverie True Crime. Reverie means to daydream but even daydreams can turn into nightmares. Join me as I tell you haunting and horrific reveries about missing people and senseless murders. I also interview survivors and people seeking justice for themselves or a loved one. New episodes come out every Monday morning, and sometimes you'll get bonus episodes on Thursdays. Wherever you're listening to this current podcast right now, you can find Reverie True Crime. Everybody, it's the Booze and Spirits podcast. It's like a drink with Turks. I mean, a drink with death. <laughs> America's most popular podcast with twenty or less listeners. <laughs> the people that like us really like us. Okay. I guess so. They We're do. just a very, very niche audience. Very niche. <laughs> Sean doesn't listen to us. One day, he got in the car, and my phone started like auto playing it because it'll play whatever I was listening to last. Uh huh. And after a minute, he went, hey, is that you guys? Uh, it doesn't sound like you guys. It sounds like, it sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, honey. Well, if you only listen to the first couple episodes, then Thanks, yeah. Thanks, Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. We got a little better. It's fine. You know what? He uh, he helps out how he can. If I need someone to drink room temperature Jägermeister out of a cabbage, he's there for me. That's the important part. <laughs> We should uh, see how much further we can push that particular skill set. Do you want? Let's get him to drink it out of a potato. Let's try to figure out what to do with like a raw egg and an eggshell. I don't know if he'll do that. He's really weird about texture. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he doesn't like. He it. doesn't do like creamy or slimy things. Yeah, yeah. All right. Some people's kids. I'm Nick McDonald. Remembering to do introductions this week. Oh, I'm Kate McDonald. I always try to do the introduction before the tagline, and then I get in trouble. But it just how my brain works yeah i think we've probably neglected introductions for weeks now because I keep... we introduced mom did we all right that was good ish <laughs> we're back we don't have any guests this week i guess we have theo well yeah we, we do have theo back we didn't have theo last week and it was you know it was a sad 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 week no theo he was sorely missed no one was there to chew pretzels and drill into the microphone well <laughs> i guess i was I didn't have pretzels last week, so... Yeah, you dropped the ball on that. (sighs) Fucking it up again. Way to fuck it up, McDonald. Way to McDonald it up. (laughs) My cider is too empty for me to tilt my head back with my headphones in this precarious position. It's too too empty, or it's so empty that you have to tip your head back? I need a straw. And then the headphones fall off. It's just just a thing. It's a whole thing. It's you a chin strap for your headphones, I think, is what you really need. (laughs) What happened to that beer helmet I stole from someone at your dorm? Um, I I had it for a long time, but I think it kind of came apart in pieces. I may still have most of it. I don't know. I think I I might tossed it. I could switch to, like, the beer helmet and earbuds. Beer helmet and earbuds. That would... (laughs) Be a look. <laughs> That's what I'm known for. That's what I'm known for. Sean's such a lucky, lucky man. <laughs> we'll get you some uh, <laughs> elbow and wrist pads while we're at it. And <laughs> I do need wrist pads. I was actually looking at 
things I consider way too overly priced today because my RA is acting up and I can't grip the weights at the gym, but they make things for that apparently. It like puts the stress on your wrist and I'm like, how is this better? Just get like uh, some hooks in time to your wrist. I could just get hooks for hands. You could just get (laughs) hooks for hands. (laughs) Bad joke. That's a bad joke. Karma is going to come get me on that one. Hey, dude, how'd you lose that hand? (laughs) Karma. Karma bit me in the ass. Well, I've been listening to this witchy podcast. I'm moderately obsessed with one of the hosts of because I don't have a gay BFF right now. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, he was talking about saint torture, where like, especially in, like heavily. That's not, a, that's not a name. That's an activity. That's an activity. So like heavily Italian nonies. That what grandmas are in Italian nonies, known as getting I mean, mad. Known, maybe nonies. I, I think nona. I don't know what noni might I, be like abuelita. Like it's like the in, the endearing version, but or it might be a naughty bit, is what <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> Okay, anyways, these Italian nonas that are, like, mad at the saint they've been praying to put them upside down in a glass of water while they wait for whatever they're trying to manifest. And they're talking about, like, Italian grandmothers that really get pissed off and just burn the saint's eyes out of their little, like, saint cards with their cigarettes every night. (laughs) And then they go blind when they're, like, 80 and they're like, I had it coming. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, I can get behind that. That's kind of, yeah, I, I can see going out like that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm on board. Makes sense to me. <laughs> oh, well, we've talked well about Italian grandmothers, so I guess now's the time to uh, mention that we're talking about <laughs> Canada this week. <laughs> that was, yeah, that was a real smooth transition. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so we're talking about Canada. She's got a can of decider right there. Ah, it's not Canadian, though. I think it's from Portland. Close. Portland wants to be Canada. I mean, it's the only place on par with Canada I know for strip clubs. <laughs> yes. New West Cider Company. True Love. Today's episode is not sponsored by Northwest Cider Company's True Love Blackberry Blueberry Cider. It's not sponsored by lots of things. <laughs> Probably anything. <laughs> Most likely. So, oh God, I forgot but we what narrowed, day it is. We narrowed it down to Victoria Day. Yeah, Victoria Day is coming up. Yeah. It was why we decided to do Canada, but now I don't remember what Victoria Day is. It's going to be a, a Monday, right? Because all of their holidays are on Mondays. Um, it's, the, it's the 24th. Does that help you? No. But it's coming up. <laughs> it's May 24th, which is a Monday. See, because for those of you who don't know, I live right on the Canadian border, and you learn that the Canadians ha- are smart and have worked themselves into having a three-day weekend at least once a month. They take time off. They haven't convinced themselves that being the hardest worker on the planet makes you superior. <laughs> okay, Canada. Better at life Can- than us. Oh, Canada. Unless they are at a mall just south of the Canadian border, then they're terrible, terrible people. Are they better at life than us? or? Well, they get to drink legally earlier than we do. Hence yeah. my time in Canadian bars as a teenager. <laughs> that could be a bad decisions club. How Kate got roofied in the Canadian strip club by the bartender. Do they still have menthol cigarettes? We still have menthol cigarettes well, for now. But not for long. Um, I think they still have menthol cigarettes. They used to have really graphic warning labels on their cigarettes. They like give you like pictures of like dead babies and blackened lungs and things yeah, instead yeah, of yeah. yeah. Yeah, most countries do that. Um, and cigarettes are much more expensive in Canada. I remember that. Yeah. I'm just curious because I'm on a. I don't smoke, but the whole idea that menthol cigarettes are more enticing to kids, and that's why they have to be gotten rid of. Um. I mean, let's not get political here, but that's blatantly an attack on minorities. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> like 100%. Because if it was an attack on being enticing to kids, then they'd fucking strip Skittles-flavored vodka right off the shelves, too. <laughs> I mean, that was the theory behind them getting rid of the, like, flavored vapes, but that lasted, what, like, a month, I think, in Oregon, at least. I don't remember oh, if that was a national thing. I don't think it was. I don't know. I don't pay attention to vapes because... Because you don't I, you don't play the douche flute? 
<laughs> well, I, I prefer to pretend it doesn't exist. <laughs> I just know the joy of them is you don't know if, if somebody's smoking tobacco or weed around here. So, like, you either have to take a stand that you're going to yell at everyone that's trying to vape on your patio at your restaurant or just not care. Maybe they could just man up and get cancer like God intended. Well, it's because they can, like, get, like, major doses of THC that way without <laughs> it being detectable. Because I don't know if you know this, but if you smoke flour, it's pretty obvious. <laughs> it's fine. No one cares. You just flick it at the cop. They think it's cool. Like, my license is on the line if I don't yell at you. So I'm going gotcha. to have to yell at you. Gotcha. It's cool. And Victoria. The, Can Can the Canadians have nationwide uh, legalized weed, too. So I mean, we're close to nationwide, I feel like. We are point. very close. We're getting there. Well, you know. Like you were talking about with menthols, you know, white people are starting to get into weed pretty heavy now, so it's it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's cool, guys. The white people are doing it. Canada. Canada! My <laughs> home and native land. Victoria. Victoria, B.C. Well, we discussed B.C., but I think we kind of stayed on Vancouver Island, essentially, right? You. Yeah, well, you know, it is Victoria Day, so I wanted to stay near Victoria and... Victoria has plenty of hauntings as is, but I, I, I branched out a little to Vancouver Island as a whole. Um, I did see some some things that consider Victoria one, if not the most haunted city in Canada. Yeah. So there's that. No reason, just <laughs> they did a poll. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't look into this. That's a part of the country that's had like a lot of First Nations wars and Bigfoot and. Wild West and English colonization, I think, was there relatively early compared to other parts of the nation. I may have graduated from high school mere yards from the Canadian border, but I don't remember that much Canadian history because that was sixth grade in Oregon. They didn't go into a lot of specifics. I think to I be fair, to be fair, you didn't move to the Canadian border until your senior year of school. Correct. So. Then I was just like, they let me drink over there. And there's so <laughs> many roundabouts. <laughs> also, in sixth grade, when we studied Canada, my focus was on Saskatchewan. Don't ask Any me why. Okay. <laughs> Never mind then. Because um, I like the word Saskatoon, I'm assuming. <laughs> ah, that works. It's like a senior year when we had to pick a Mexican state to study in Spanish class. I went with Oaxaca because I like to say Oaxaca. <laughs> you didn't do it with Chihuahua? No. That's what everyone picked. I didn't have a Chihuahua then. That was a couple of years after high school that I got the demon chihuahua of Fleet Street. So. so, Victoria Day, and we actually like Victoria a lot as a city. We do. We both do. We went there. I don't. You have you been there more than that one time we went, or I'm sure you have. We're gonna go back to the fact that I drank a lot when I was in Canada. <laughs> Yeah, but most of your drinking was, like, around Vancouver. Like, you didn't accidentally end up in Victoria, I presume. No, but I can't, I genuinely can't remember how many times I've been there. Okay. One time our grandparents scheduled a big family reunion in Victoria, and they got some vacation rental Airbnb type thing. And It was a beautiful house, like, a block from the bay, and the guy that owned it was probably taking sneaky videos of us the whole time and stealing stuff. It's fine. It was very creepy. He was very upset that we brought so many people. Like, we didn't bring more people than the listing said it would accommodate, but he didn't expect us to bring that many. So he had to let us into the lower level of the house for people to sleep, which he wasn't expecting to have to do. And he had some creepy room. He would show up in the middle of the day. And go into some creepy room that only had access from the outside that was on the lower level. Yeah. And the room Kate and I were staying in, we could notice that there was light leakage over the top of the wall into our bedroom. And we had no idea what room was on the other side of that wall. We th we had no access to it, whatever it was. Well, and like Nick and I were staying in this weird children's room in the basement that was like essentially completely basement landlocked. There was no windows. Mm -hmm. There was just a door and there was about a half inch crack around the where the wall should have met the ceiling that just had red lights <laughs> behind it. And there was what was probably a two-way mirror in the bathroom room yeah but we didn't learn until we were older how to check easily on that and then like nick was reading some book 
I was reading In Search of Schrodinger's Cat. I brought it with me from home. I had been reading it. I was continue reading it. I left it on a side table in the living room. We left to go do family stuff. And when we came back... It would have been switched out for something, hadn't it? Yeah, it was missing. It had been replaced with a Sherlock Holmes mystery book. And I couldn't find my goddamn book. And I wasn't going to take the Sherlock Holmes one because it didn't belong to me. So the whole thing was creepy and weird. Creepy, creepy person. That was also the week that I learned that Canadian, like, bitch beers. People people have moved on to, like, the White Claws and the Trulies, but in our younger days, they were, like, the Smirnoffs, Mike Hard Lemonade, (laughs) Zima Zima days. And uh, the Canadian version of that isn't made with malt liquor. They're made with vodka. So they hit a lot (laughs) faster and a lot harder. (laughs) And we were all drinking because we were stuck there with our family, particularly my dad's family. (laughs) Family vacations equate drinking. There were arguments on the street about which crosswalk we should cross at between (laughs) the adults. Fact. (laughs) At one point they wanted to go on a boat adventure and mom had a panic attack. She said, I can't be on a boat with these people, Steve. I can't can't be stuck out there in the water with these people. I really hope none of them are listening. So, we both got Victoria-ish stories. I'll take your burp as a yes. <laughs> Mine's Victoria. I mean, okay. I do I do leave Victoria briefly during my story. Do you? Yeah. Okay. Do you want to go first? Should I go first? Who went first last time? I don't remember. I don't know. I can go first because okay. your story has more to do with my drink, I think. It has more to do with drinking, period. Mine does. Mine, mine dabbles in drinking. Really, it's oh, just that mine has much more to do. So mine has a character that becomes a raging alcoholic. It's fine. The hero's journey is uh, what they call that. Is that? Am I just a hero? Sure. Need a hero. <laughs> Need a hero that can finish this drink. So. As I think we've previously established, I'm a big fan of the Empress Hotel and the Empress 1908 Butterfly Pea Blossom Infused Gin. It's come up a little bit. I'm a bitch loves gin. I'm a bitch loves alcohol, to be honest. (laughs) And that is, in fact, one of the haunted locations of Victoria, B.C. So the Fairmont Empress Hotel is pretty well known for its hauntings. It's one of the most uniquely Canadian chateau-style hotels in the world, apparently. Obviously, it's in Canada. Sorry, there was more <laughs> plan here before I started drinking, and now my notes are just kind of all over the place. <laughs> You're not supposed to make your notes drunk. <laughs> it's not me. They, I didn't make them drunk. I'm just deciphering them after I was waiting okay. for my computer to catch up, so I just was taking shots and eating snacks. <laughs> Why is this weird to you? So... <laughs> Back to our story. Back to reality. No, I don't want to go there. Uh, Okay, so the uh, Empress Hotel was designed by Francis Rottenberry. Of the Ronnie Rottenberries? What? What does that even mean? Do you not know Ronnie Rotten? Did you not watch Lazy Town? (laughs) Oh, you're baffled. You should look up Lazy Town. It's a fever dream. Isn't that a cartoon? No, it was like a live action. That's Busy Town. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Richard, Richard Scary's Busy Town, not the same as Lazy Town. <laughs> the polar opposite. <laughs> You'd think I watch a lot of cartoons with my child, but no, we've been watching Criminal Minds. Should I not be watching Criminal Minds? <laughs> <laughs> where on the scale do you think Victoria falls between Busy Town and Lazy Town? Like, where on that bar graph is... <laughs> I don't know because I don't know Lazy Town. <laughs> People in Victoria are kind of busy. There's a lot of bunnies. There are a lot of bunnies all over the UVic campus, just everywhere to roll in. <sighs> okay, I can focus. <laughs> Victoria's Empress Hotel was started in 1904, finished being built in 1908. It has an assortment of ghosts. So this is a pretty huge hotel. I think they have like... I want to say about 500 rooms at minimum. I think it's like eight floors. They have added onto it since the original construction, but um, it's been around a while and it's had, you know, a few people die in it. Most hotels have. 
Yeah. They don't want you to know that. That's where you go to kill people. I mean... It's also where a lot of people go to kill themselves. It's true, it's, because then their they family do. doesn't have to clean it up. Yup. Oh, why do I know this shit? Anyway. Not everyone did. Apparently not. Anyway. So there's uh, multiple apparitions within the halls of the Empress, as well as at least a couple outside. There's some ghosts that they think they've pinpointed. There's Lizzie McGrath, who was a chambermaid. She worked there the in the beginning days of the hotel. And she lived there as well. And she would, every night before bed, she would go out onto the fire escape with her rosary. She was an Irish immigrant that had just come there, started working at the hotel, living at the hotel. Yeah, she's got a name like there should be a limerick written about her. Well, <laughs> I guess there could be. So she would always just step outside, say her rosary, and then go to bed. Well, one night they were doing some work and they had taken the fire escapes down. <laughs> Lizzie just walked out like her fire escape was there and fell to her death. <laughs> so that's a, that's a fucking surprise. Yeah. <laughs> That's a real rough way to go. So um, Lizzie has been seen outside below what was her window, often clutching her rosary. And they also think that they see her still just going about her duties in the hotel, cleaning things. She must have been pretty diligent to not notice they removed the fucking fire escape. Uh, well, she was Irish Catholic. Maybe she was drunk. We don't know. We don't need to judge her. Okay. She was trying to do her right thing, and she died. She prayed to a grappling hook instead of a rosary. She might still be with us. So Ramsey would be safe in this scenario. Ramsey has a grappling hook. I'm aware. I'm a little scared, but I'm aware. And it's only a few years till killing and gets one too. I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> there is a resident that walks the halls knocking on doors. It's an elderly woman in her, her night things. I've only seen it say pajamas, but I feel like early 1900s, I bet there wouldn't be a woman in pajamas, as you and I picture. Yeah, that seems unlikely. Yeah. Anyway, she was a woman that I believe was from Calgary, and then she'd come to Victoria in the winter and live in the hotel because the weather was better there. Which, the weather in Victoria is pretty rough, but I guess way rougher in, in Alberta. <laughs> in Calgary. <It's> true. <laughs> <laughs> by that she'll knock on doors and then if you open the door she just like vanishes down the hall towards the elevator shaft she was found after she passed of natural causes in her room by one of the managers and her room had issues after that they kept renting it out and pretending nothing had happened but the activity didn't slow down and it was building a bad rapport. And they needed to put elevators in anyway. So they took out her room and put in the elevator shaft. And I think that's part of the reason she wanders around knocking, trying to figure she can't find her room now. That's also kind of interesting that the elevator shaft was her room. And when they see her, she goes zipping back towards the elevator shaft. She's trying to find her damn room. Or she's going back there because that's where her room's supposed to be. Yeah, she's like, uh, where is it? It goes here. <laughs> My stuff's gone. <laughs> what the fuck happened? People keep crossing up and down through my room. Yeah. Imagine being dead and not knowing you're dead and fucking people are, are going vertically through your room all the time. Not a fan, my friends. I'm not a fan of this. <laughs> and then we'll get to the big ghost. So back to the building being designed by Francis Rattenbury. So he also did the parliament buildings, which I believe they might be a block or two away, but I'm pretty sure you can see them all there. So they're, you know, pretty big, impressive buildings. The Parliament building is awe-inspiring and has been raved about for years. It was built in 1891, and that man went $400,000 over budget in 1891. <laughs> That's a lot of money. That's, yeah. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't an oopsie. That was a... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Mr. Rattenbury, uh, who is also rumored to haunt the Parliament buildings, but he's supposed to also haunt the Empress Hotel. People see a man with a mustache... In an old suit walking around. Old style suit. Not, but his personal life is where the story gets really interesting. He was married to his wife, Flory. And it was rumored he had a lot of affairs on Flory. He was he was hoeing around. He was a hoe. Ho. That's why he went $400,000 over budget. He had to put in a bunch of extra apartments for all of his girlfriends. Yeah, well, so he um, was a British immigrant. I think he had gotten rich kind of during the Klondike gold rush. That's where he, like, 
basically got people to give him money. He like brought in stuff via railroad and things to overcharge for. But he won the bid for the Empress Hotel, got it built, all these things. But in the 1920s, he left his wife, Florence, or Flory, who he had been married to since 1898, and his children for the then 27-year-old, twice married already, <laughs> Alma Pockenham. Pockenham? Cake in ham? I don't know. Alma. This fucking Alma. So She's packing ham. Uh, yeah, she she's Alma packing ham up in that cooch cooch. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> Sorry, not sorry. I don't know. I don't know. But Worst shoplifter ever. Not sure. <laughs> Once smuggle a whole ham out of a Piggly Wiggly's and nothing but Daisy Duke's tube top. <laughs> anyway, when he starts his affair with Alma, he's like, oh, she's the one. Fuck <laughs> Flory. I'm on Team Alma now. To the point that he tries to get Flory to move out of their home, and she's like, no, this is my home. These are our children. I'm not moving. So he just moves Alma in. He meets Alma because she's the piano player at the Empress Hotel. So Alma just plays the death march on the piano in the house to fuck with Flory. Like constantly. Constantly. Just <laughs> plays the death march. That's a, the black parade for beautiful. Ah, <sighs> pretty much. And then um, Flory still is like, this is my house. What the fuck are you guys doing? So Francis just starts parading Alma around town, making a big show of it really pissing off all the other socialites because they actually like Florence and like are like, this guy's a dick. Why is he doing this? Like, okay, it's you were cheating on her, fine, but this is a little much. It gets to the point that uh, he moves out of the house with Alma, shuts off the utilities to the house that Flory and the kids live in. Within a year of this starting, Flory dies of cancer and everyone in town is like, the stress of this did this to her. Like, her awful husband and this bitch is why Flory's dead, which is probably fair. Yeah. Meanwhile, he had to move out because he had to find some bigger house to keep his fucking balls in because he's got some huge brass walls, Apparently. It sounds like. <laughs> so they're there for a little while being pariahs, and they're, it's not working out. You know, they want to be fancy. They want to be seen. They want to be the assholes they are. So they flee back to England. <laughs> Well, while they're in England, Francis starts drinking like a fish, and Alma, who's, you know, half his age, doesn't want to deal with it, doesn't want to be around him, so she starts having their driver, who's eight, 17 at the time they hire him, 17 at the time, uh, start driving her places when her husband's drinking. Yeah. She doesn't want to deal with him. Oh, he starts driving her. He starts packing that ham. <laughs> uh, <laughs> making it a thing. What'd you do last night? I packed that ham. So his name was George, George Stoner, her, her teenage chauffeur. She starts having an affair with him. We get to mm -hmm. 1935, and it sounds like uh, they didn't have a lot of friends, none of them, including George. It sounds like George grew up, like, <laughs> Imagine. kind of, like, with Imagine. Shel very sheltered, not a lot of outside people. He was homeschooled. He is homeschooled. Was, <laughs> yeah, real homeschooled. Little homeschooled driver boy. You're just a baby. <laughs> yeah. So um, I guess they just decide that they're sick of Francis. And George creeps in in the early hours while Francis is asleep in his chair and starts beating him with, I've read a carpenter's mallet and a croquet mallet. So, you know, whatever we're talking about here, it's a mallet. Beats his head <laughs> so hard that he breaks the back of his skull off, knocks his false teeth across the room. He doesn't die immediately from this. It takes four days. Four days Yikes. for this man to die of this mallet beating. This malady. Is there any malady? God. Boo. <laughs> Sorry. Boo. Dad jokes are life, yo. Yeah. So does, is there any word on if Francis is uh, like conscious for this, or is he just... In a vegetative state. I, I'm not sure. I did not find specifics regarding that. Okay. Hopefully the latter. I hope but so. But also fuck him, son. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> not going to say he didn't have it coming, but that's real, real rough. <laughs> but Alma panics. And she's like, I did it. Sorry, guys. I just got sick of a shit. I did it. <laughs> and then it comes to, like, she's in jail. Her son comes to visit her. And after he visits her, she's like, 
so I talked to my son, and he's right. I didn't do it. <laughs> my mistake. My bad. Whoops. No, she, I was thinking. I was thinking some other millionaire I beat to death. Yeah. <laughs> so she basically says that she was trying to protect George. That like George did it. She she knew that George did it, but she didn't want him to get in trouble. Blah 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 blah. So George goes to trial. Kind simple George. Alma also goes to trial for it. I believe to be an accessory. She was acquitted, but George gets found guilty and is sentenced to be hung. So Alma panics. <laughs> this bitch. This bitch. Suicide. <laughs> Pan Romeo and Juliet here. Like, oh, fuck. I'm going to go kill myself because I don't know what's happening. Suicide. Because she's got lethal coochie, apparently. Stabs herself. Oh, God. Six times. Three of which penetrate her heart. With Wikipedia says a dagger, but everywhere else I look said a pair of scissors. Yikes. So she stabs herself six times with a pair of scissors and then launches herself into the river Stour. So And lived for six days. <laughs> um, I, I think she died relatively quickly there. Okay. Stoner serves seven years of his sentence. They decide they're not going to hang him after, like, mass outcry from the, like, English people. From the homeschool home authority. Yeah. yeah. So homeschool group. They're like, okay, I guess we won't hang him, but he still has to go to jail. So he goes to jail for seven years, and then he's released early to fight in World War II. Yeah, then he just lives this, like, normal, quiet life for the most part. <laughs> he marries a new woman in 1944. They have a daughter in 48. He does get probation and media attention again in 1990 where he apparently assaulted a 12-year-old boy in a washroom. <laughs> they did... By the, what are you doing, kid? When I was your age, I was already seducing mistresses and... Yeah. Um, it turns, back in ham. It turns out that uh, they believe he assaulted this child because of his Alzheimer's. So they didn't give him a, a strict sentencing for that. And then he died in 2000. Mm. So Francis Rattenberry has been dead... He just got a headstone in 2007. <laughs> so not only is this guy murdered, not a great dude, but did some great things architecturally. Yeah. He is in an unmarked grave until very modern days. Yeah, we'll get around to it. Yeah. <laughs> so, but he is seen around the hotel and he's also seen around the parliament building. There's been some, like, plays based upon their story, and... Oh, really? Yeah. There's a chamber opera called Rattenbury based on them. There's a few novels. It's also suggested recently that Alma's suicide was because of the tabloid pressure that was put mm. on her. Did she go out of her way to piss off everybody in, yeah. in Victoria, so why would she... I don't know. Also, they should make a rock'em sock'em robot based off of uh, George. You hit the robot in the back of the head hard enough, his teeth fall out. That was Francis, whose teeth fell out. I, I guess know, George, George did the hittings. He's. Oh, uh, I mean, it would need to be a pair of robots. Anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's my story. You like that? Interesting. That is a interesting one. Should I move on to mine? Unless you want to talk about pack and ham more. Maybe. Nothing people love to hear more than siblings talking about pack and ham, right? You made that sound way creepier than it was. That's what I'm here for. Okay, so I found the story of Kanaka Pete. Kanaka Pete was not a Victoria story. He's a Vancouver Island story. Some of his adventures take place in Victoria, but mostly it's further up the island. So Kanaka Pete was an immigrant from Hawaii who got a job as a woodcutter in the mid-1800s in Nanaimo. I guess at this time there was a lot of Hawaiian immigrants to the area. I don't know what drew them. Maybe it was There's just... There's a uh, lot of Hawaiian immigrants in this part of Oregon and in Bellingham. So I don't know. They're like, it's too sunny there. I guess. Like, life, life is too refreshing. Screw paradise. I want to be drenched in cold rain every day. Pete's real name was Pete Kakua, and he left Honolulu in 1853 for Pacific Northwest. When he got here, he kind of bounced around to various forts and towns, like mining jobs, shipping jobs, and eventually he ended up woodcutting in Nanaimo. He married a First Nations woman named QN, 
but everyone just called her Mary because, you know, it was mostly English settlers. <laughs> and uh, they had a child. So the story goes that in 1868, Pete's wife had left him. And after several days, he received word from her brother that she wasn't coming back. So Pete said, fuck it, I'm going to go get drunk. This is the first in what sounds like a week's worth of drinking. <laughs> so Just a week's worth? Well, uh, eventually he goes to jail. So okay. <laughs> Pete finds out his wife's not coming home. He goes out and he starts drinking. <laughs> he comes home around midnight, still drunk, and he's surprised to find that there's a fire burning in the house. So he gets in and q is there along with her parents. Uh, I'm going to murder these names. Squashy Lick and Shilatinord. Squashy Lick and Packenham, got it. Yeah. He asks, you know, has she changed her mind? And she says, no, they're all just there so they can collect her things. So he says, fuck it, I'm going to go drink more. So he leaves again. <laughs> go drinking. It's after midnight, so the pubs are closed. So he goes over to a friend's house and bumps some whiskey off of him. After a while, continuing getting his drink on, he says, well, damn it, it's my house. I'm at least going to go back and sleep on my floor, if nothing else. <laughs> so he returned home. This is where things get crazy. And most of this account comes from Pete's own testimony as to what happened. So Pete comes home and says he finds his father-in-law in bed with his wife. What? With his mother-in-law looking on while tending the baby. So Pete, again, this is his testimony. He says he grabs the father by his hair and yanks him off of his wife. They start fighting. And during the fight, the old man bites off a chunk of Pete's finger. Then the mother began to uh, get involved in the fray. She rushes at him and grabs a rod and starts hitting Pete with it. Pete, very inebriated, <laughs> is suffering through the pain pretty good and finally decides to fight back and reaches for the only thing he can get his hands on, which happens to be an axe. Well, it wasn't the baby, at least. It wasn't the baby. At this point, Pete remembers nothing until he's standing over the bodies of his wife, her parents, and the baby all chopped to pieces. So Pete realizes what's happened. He's hacked all his family to death. So he goes to bed, wakes up, starts drinking some more. <laughs> this, is, this is a long spree of drinking. Drinks all day. Eventually, that evening, he goes and he tells a friend, Tom Ali, and I don't know if that name is a First Nations or Hawaiian, I'm not sure. But he tells his friend, Tom Ali, that he had to leave because of what he had done. And he shows Tom Lee where he got his finger bitten off by q father as proof. But Tom Lee still didn't believe him. Said, nah, nah, you're just messing with me, right? So eventually a search party catches up to Pete on the abandoned Newcastle Island. And Newcastle Island used to be a smallpox colony, but nobody's there anymore. That's why it's abandoned at the time. He was in the company of a black man named Adam Stepney. I thought you were going to say Black Knight, and I got really excited. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, no, just normal black man, not a not a knightly black okay. man. Okay. Adam Stepney, who uh, claimed he found himself coming out of a brownout drinking incident at dawn and <laughs> woke up to find himself rowing a canoe with Pete towards the mainland. <laughs> so at this point, Adam realizes he doesn't know Pete, and he doesn't want to go to the mainland. So... <laughs> He demands that Pete drops him off on Newcastle Island, and Pete says, all right, fine. So so they go over to Newcastle Island. There they build a fire, and they continue to drink some more. <laughs> so, Are we sure Pete's not from 10 Mile? <laughs> so, I don't think they'd call him Kanaka Pete if he was from 10 Mile. Where do things have happened? <laughs> So they build the fire, they keep drinking on in the afternoon, and then eventually the search party finds them <laughs> on the island well plastered. They take Adam into custody, but they never arrest him, never charge him, because Pete says, no, 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 he's just some drunk guy I met in the middle of the night who got to help me row. He has no idea what's going on. He's just him. my hobo friend. <laughs> yes. Got, we've all gotten drunk with somebody we didn't know and hopped into a canoe in the middle of the night, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to say no, but <laughs> this is where things start to get a little uh, iffy. First of all, the coroner's report confirmed Pete's claims that he kind of had a fit of rage and killed everybody with the axe. 
that they were all axe murdered? Yeah. The coroner said, yes, as a matter of fact, it does appear they were murdered with an axe. Well, and the coroner also recommended that the court use mercy because he considered it was an act of passion. But that was thrown out because the court decided that that was beyond the scope of the coroner's duties. So they just ripped that part off of the piece of paper and published a new one that had that part omitted. Hmm. They continue to play this kind of shell game where they're stacking the deck against Pete. Magistrate William Spaulding was the prosecutor. So he kind of saw to it that the murders were publicized as not just a fit of passion, but as a specific targeting of the local Pindleyuit tribe, which made the case a political one because now suddenly all the First Nations folks are watching this trial and seeing how the people react to it and and do they really care about the First Nations people, or they'll they just let them kill us whenever they want? So now they've got all that pressure placed on top of them. Spalding and the Attorney General Henry Creese, they kind of feigned a miscommunication setup so that Pete's defense couldn't get copies of the deposition and other important documentation before the trial. Then they rushed the trial through so that Pete's defense didn't have enough time to repair the paper trail. The jury was made up entirely of white men, despite six Hawaiian men's names being on the official register. (laughs) Pete pled not guilty to all four murders, and uh, the defense was made that the killings were unintended, act of passion spurred on by drunkenness. The defense even played the card that Pete killing these folks in his culture's eyes was not the same kind of vicious, lawless act that it might be in a white English Christian eye. Which didn't do me any favors because then the jury foreman just twisted that into Pete being a godless man and was seduced by the devil and drink and they found him guilty on all counts. So they hung him on March 10th, 1869. Before they hung him, Pete vowed that he would return and have vengeance. But he, I guess, was very quiet and stoic when he was on the gallows. Like, he didn't say anything. He just went up very quietly, took his hang in and twitched a little bit after they dropped. That was the most they got from him. But neither the Europeans nor the First Nations wanted him buried on their lands. So they ended up burying him on the far eastern side of Newcastle Island, where they figured he'd be out of everybody's way. So in 1899, the Vancouver Coal Mining and Land Company ended up digging up Pete's grave while they were preparing the land for something or other. I missed uh, what they were doing. But... They dug up Pete, and they decided that they needed to move him, so they did, but they never really said where they moved him, and they didn't mark the grave, so he's just fucking somewhere out there now. <laughs> Probably in BC. That's how we how we have it narrowed yeah, down. Somewhere, like. somewhere on Newcastle Island is like the, the closest we can get. So, reports now say that he haunts that far side of Newcastle Island, and he attacks anyone left out there after dark. Interestingly, before the coal mine company dug him up, he was blamed for a mine explosion in 1887. Hmm. But before and after that, there's several stories of people going missing from the far side of Newcastle Island. This is one of those where everyone says, oh yeah, well bad things happen, but like nobody has like real specific examples. Yeah, but I did find one person who wrote out an eyewitness report. And this was from a young woman who went camping on Newcastle Island uh, near Halloween. And I didn't get a year on this, but it was fairly recently. So she was just looking for trouble. Well, yeah, she had heard the legends because she was going on a tour of Newcastle Island and somebody like told her legends. She was, oh, well, that sounds like fun. Let's go check that out. So her and her boyfriend went camping out there. They said that the island has like no camping beyond this point signs. And an older local told them that those signs were there because of the foul spirits on that end of the island, including Pete. Well, and if a bunch of people died of smallpox there, too, I'm sure it's just like... Oh, I see what you're saying. So it'd be more ghosties there because of that? Yeah, I'm just saying, like, that's not... There's not cheery energy there, no no matter how we play this down. So they they stayed on the good side of the signs. They didn't go past the signs to set up their tent. Uh, They did go hiking over there during the day, though. And they were hiking the trail and just randomly found a rabbit with its head chopped off. And she said it looked like it was freshly chopped off. That's where I left that. (laughs) So they thought that was weird. They went back to their tent. They tried to sleep. And 
through most of the night, they would hear occasionally a scream followed by the noise of chopping deep in the woods. And that happened several times. Eventually, it ramped up to there just a demonic roar, which was followed by more terrified screams and even more violent chopping. And then there was some kind of crazy, eerie laughter echoing through the woods. And as they sat there, you know, scared out of their minds, they tried to get their cell phones out. There was no cell phone reception the whole time they heard all these noises. They had reception during the day before, and they had reception the morning after. But during that part, they had no cell phone reception. You know, it's one of those situations where I, I wasn't a believer when I went in, but I'm never going back <laughs> type situations. Seems fair. Seems legit. Yeah. yeah. So, axe wielding, angry Hawaiian ghost with an army of smallpox warriors or something. Oh, I know. Crazy shit happens when you party naked. <laughs> so that's what we've got. Those are, I mean, there's plenty more Victoria ghost stories, but I guess those are the ones that caught our attention. This time. Dun, dun, Do we dun. have a, a Victoria drink that caught your attention? Well, I'm going to be honest, still still pinpointing this. Yes, I do. I think once we hit double digits, that's just kind of the uh, running theme. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, as we discussed in the last episode, I was like, Empress 1908 gin. And you and mom were like, fuck you, Canadian whiskey. And then mom <laughs> sang a song. Um <laughs> that none of us have ever heard. Might have been one she made up right then. Um, <laughs> so I was like, okay, fine. I'm not going to lie. I still might do something with some Empress 1908 gin because I have a bottle of it sitting in my liquor stash right now. But I did decide to... Wouldn't it be the first time that we did more than one drink? Wouldn't be the more, first time I drank more than one thing while I was talking about another thing. <laughs> so we're going to do Canadian whiskey. Okay. But we're going to take some inspiration here from Kanaka Pete. Okay. So you're going to hit someone with an axe? While I'm drinking. <laughs> and then I'm going to shake up a cocktail. Um, so I'm going to try to go a little bit tiki bar here. I'm okay with that. I like a good tiki bar. So let's be honest. There's not a lot of whiskey tiki drinks traditionally. That is very true. Not going to say there's none, but there's not a lot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some Pendleton because it's my preferred Canadian whiskey. And I'm going to infuse it with some chai tea for some, like, some different flavors. And it's actually going to probably, ch I think it's going to change the mouthfeel on the whiskey, too. It's going to make it drier. Wonderful mouthfeel. That was fucking creepy. The, the word mouthfeel is creepy. The word mouthfeel is normal. <laughs> texture? Do you want me to say the texture of the whiskey? Because that's not quite the same thing. Anyway, I've been doing, I honestly started researching tiki stuff way more than I researched my ghost stories this week <laughs> so you know it's not uncommon for there to be ginger or nutmeg or something involved in a tiki drink yeah. and bc is such a like cultural melting pot that i'm like yeah chai fucking works here so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna infuse this whiskey with chai i'm still gonna make a rum based tiki cocktail and i have a couple of different rums to play with because i'm not sure if i want to do like a white rum or a spiced rum i don't think i want to do a dark rum if I'm already doing whiskey. I think that's going to be a little too much. And then a painkiller is like a very traditional tiki drink that's got like coconut cream and pineapple juice and orange juice and two kinds of rum in it, a little bit of nutmeg. Kind of want to play on that. The coconut cream always gives that a really nice texture in my opinion. It makes it, I like, I like frothy creamy shit. Like, sorry, <laughs> who I am as a person. So I think what I'm leaning towards right now is this chai whiskey some rum some coconut cream some pineapple juice and then determining right now if i want to do like some passion fruit or some orange so i have some different syrups and juices i'm going to play around with this a little bit but i'm pretty gung-ho on the chai whiskey the rum and the coconut Okay. We're gonna we're gonna mix and match here a little bit. Like, like I really love guava, but I just don't think that's the right flavor profile. And I do actually have some more traditional passion fruit as well as some red passion fruit syrup. So we'll see. We'll see what happens here. But it's gonna be fruity and Polynesian and, and whiskey whiskey based with some chai because there's why not? Because fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. All right. 
and I'm sure they'll be like, I'll get some fresh lime in there and you know, all that good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Things I know about tiki recipes, it's really important you don't try to use concentrate or like roses lime. Like we want to use like fresh. Copy. Yeah. All right. And then, you know, maybe I'll find a nice Bigfoot tiki mug since I can't Ooh. find like a smallpox tiki mug. <laughs> maybe you didn't look very hard. <laughs> Uh, okay, that sounds good. We'll have the full experimented on and stamped and approved version of that. I'm going to drink at least 16 versions right. of this to find the right one for you guys. <laughs> Probably all in one setting. So it's going to be number 14. I'm going to be like, that was the <laughs> one. I'm not going to remember what was in it. but Only people appreciate the sacrifice. I work really show. hard for you people. All 20 of you. All 20 of you. <laughs> no one even fluffs my ego about it. It's fine. <laughs> I do get posts on Twitter about, oh, this looks so good. I don't know how many people have actually tried them. No one's come out and said if they have. So if you have, let us know. I know my friend Angel bought a lemon peel ghost shirt, at least. So someone appreciates it. Cool, cool, cool. So I guess we're wrapping things up here. We need to figure out what we're doing next episode. Hookers and blow. Hookers and blow. Okay, next episode we're going to be doing hookers and blow. And we're going to tell you about the ghosts in our blood. <laughs> You're fairly drunk. I'm not. I'm not. I just really wish I was because it would make so much more sense. <laughs> <laughs> this is who I am now. Can your brain atrophy? Because I think that's happened. This is me now. <laughs> Deal with it. This is who I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> We doing hookers and blow next time. We're gonna come up with something else. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a lot of dead hooker stories that I feel like I can talk about publicly. So uh, okay, so statute of limitations isn't up yet. So uh... <laughs> yeah, we gotta get some legislature to shorten that one on murdering hookers. It's not like you're killing a person. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke, people. <laughs> I support you in the sex industry, unless we unless you're there. By force, then then I'll kill whoever you want me to. <laughs> Why I didn't go into social work? Because I was going to murder people, and I'd get away with it for at least a little while. <laughs> She's like Dexter. She kills the bad people, and kind of loses the message after the third season. New, there's going to be a one, another season though. It's coming. All I want, I don't want a new Dexter season. What I want is I want Dexter versus Burn Notice. That's what I want. They're both based in Miami. You would think that with the kind of dealings that they do, they would cross paths at least once. I'll, um, That's what I want. I'll write my congressman for you. Okay. <laughs> Is your congressman Jeffrey Donovan? Because that would help things a lot. I don't think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do we have a real topic that anyone wants to explore? What are we coming up on? We're coming up on June. Is this... No, Father's Day is in the second half of June, right? So we don't have to think about that. I don't, I don't know if we're going to talk Dad into this. Probably not. He, the giant marionettes were mentioned, and he immediately recoiled <laughs> and said he doesn't like to talk about that. Hey, well, and I remember that now that, yeah, that is a hard one to get out of him. I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> Our dad has a story about ghostly marionettes appearing above his bed. Which my mother also saw, not knowing that that was a thing. <laughs> Flag Day, Father's Day, Memorial Day? It'll be up before Memorial Day. We could do military ghosts, war ghosts. I don't need, like, oh, I don't need that in my life. <laughs> Why is I that? I live with a combat vet. I don't need that in my oh, life. Oh, well, that's fair. It just dropped noisy things. Noisy things. National Cheese Day. Yeah. Or National Hug Your Cat Old day. Maid's Day. These are the same day. <laughs> National <laughs> Cheese Day and Old Maid's Day are the same day. Well, I don't have Old Maid Day on my list, but I have National Hug Your Cat Day being the same day. Maybe they change Old Maid's Day to National Hug Your Cat Day. The same day. <laughs> Six of one, half dozen to the other. National Yo-Yo Day. Jefferson Davis's birthday. We already did an episode with a lot of Jefferson Davis. <laughs> um, I mean, I do have a Yo-Yo Ghost story, but... National Donald Duck I just day. saw that. Kamehameha Day. Oh, you said Kamehameha. What did you hear? Kamehameha. <laughs> I was like, panic. <laughs> come, my lady, come, come, my lady. You're my butterfly, sugar, baby. Babe, Yo. what should our next episode be about? Um, I don't know. What kind of ghost stories? Ghost of Derps. National Peanut Butter Cookie Day! <laughs>
National Prune Day. <laughs> National Derp Day. National Derp Day is every day. <laughs> What's the region y'all haven't touched on yet? Well, give us some, and I'll tell you if we've touched it. We could do haunted tourist attractions, because we're getting into, like, vacation season. We could do haunted tourist attractions. Theme parks and roadside stops and that kind of stuff. And the, like, original carousel at the Magic Kingdom? Maybe. I don't have any in mind, but I'm sure we could find something. Well, the original carousel at Magic Kingdom was supposed to be Portal, and they moved it. Japan, there's that whole suicide forest. Sean's moved on to Japan. People do make tourist treks to the suicide forest. This is for true. God knows whatever reason. <laughs> derp, derp. Dog ghosts. Now I'm going to tourist. Oh, tourist attractions. To- tourism ghosts. Ghosts of tourism. Ghosts of tourists. <laughs> ghosts of tourists. Got at least three of them in the trunk of my car. I have an SUV. I can't really keep the ghost in the trunk. Are you going to uh, go to the Oregon Vortex and record your part from there? I don't know if they have Wi-Fi. Probably not. <laughs> I mean, we have discussed going to the the House of Mystery here soon. All right. Let's put this sucker to bed. All right. All right. Next time we'll talk about tourists, ghosts, tourism ghosts. Uh, Check out our show notes. That's where we put links to all our socials, all the other places you can catch our podcast in case you're currently listening to it from something that you hate. (laughs) Links to our website. Links to ways that you can support us. Uh, We've got Patreon. You can support us through Anchor. You can shop RT Public Store. All those links are in our show notes. You can Venmo me. You can just tell me I looked pretty for that episode. I know you can't see me, but this bitch likes compliments, so. We did one episode with you. Yeah, and I didn't put on makeup. Oh. Rough. Just bad. I have a face for radio, but tell me I look pretty. (laughs) Um, Always drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up donut. (laughs) <laughs> Are you going? I started, and then you started, and then I well, like, only got out. Because whenever you read it, then you always end up trying to finish it, and we're supposed to trade off. It's, uh, you, don't, you don't trade off. You're a ball hog. <laughs> I'm an Aries. Duh. <laughs> How is always, this news? <laughs> all right. Always drink responsibly and in accordance with your local laws. Don't end up our next ghost. Next then ghost. Next donut. ghost. Next ghost! Next Next ghost! God, we're children. I get why people (laughs) don't listen. (laughs) Bye, everybody. Bye! (laughs) Those 20 listeners just won.